We simply get the chemistry that we had before, more or less isolated trimeric unit. But when we enlarge the molecular ion of the central atom from strontium to barium, then we could extend the coordination number of the central ion. And with this extension of the coordination number, we could, all, we could design the polymerization of the subunit by this end center type of coordination. So some of the outer sphere morpholine coordinate to the central barium, but each second barium atom is just involved in this business. That means we have an indefinite chain of two different barium containing uh, building blocks. So at least the basic concepts that we can introduce additional weak coordinate bonds works with these systems. The coordination geometry of the metals sometimes pushes polymerization by itself. I did not mention this example before since it finally ends with a polymer. It ends with a polymer when we make a combination between nickel and silver. Expectedly, Nickel goes to the center of the molecule, silver to the sulfur atoms, but the coordination sphere of silver is not always linear. This is a mistake I think worldwide is taught in the first classes of chemistry. We always, coming from the silver diamine complex, say silver makes a linear coordination. Silver has a closed shell. Silver makes everything. Silver 1 makes tridentate uh, uh, coordination, tetradentate coordination. This is no problem for, for the silver. And in this case, the coordination sphere of silver is extended, and it, it does not end with this monomeric unit as is given here. In the solid state, it polymerizes by the connection of these trinuclear compounds to an indefinite helical chain by taking additional donor atoms of the neighboring unit. So two of the silver atoms share the outer sulfur atoms to polymerize to a long, long helical chain. And finally, let's go to pi stacking. We had one example where this compound coordinate, this was the manganese and this prosium compound, where we saw the some uh, pi stacking between the central units. And here we see some overlap of the central, uh, central pyridine ring. This is not a very tight by bonding, no tight interactions, but just weak interactions. But in principle, we can also claim this type of compounds. We did not yet prepare, this is in our plan, some uh, anthracene compound to give the opportunity in the periphery. Well, we see that the small units can be polymerized to supramolecular units. And I come to the end of my talk. I think one hour is enough to bother you with this chemistry. And so let me summarize shortly. This Innocent ligands can be used for a huge amount of combination of different metal ions and applying different basic concepts of inorganic chemistry, we can prepare trimeric, tetrameric compounds. From time to time, we have bis or tris complexes. We have redox chemistry interfering our reactivity and we can control the size of the cavity by changing the periphery of the ligand. Such basic compounds can be polymerized by strong coordinate bond, weak coordinate bond, coordination chem chemistry, the coordination requirements of the metal ions, and from time to time by pi stacking. So I, I finally say 
thank you, thank you to different persons. First to Jean Marie Lane to guide us. Then to the people you have seen before, my students who did the work. Then to some institutions who gave the money. Without money, no research. And this is uh, the DAAD. This is CAPES and CNPG. They paid Seiler, for example. DAAD gave a scholarship to Jacob and to Hui. I forgot the Vietnamese government, who also paid some money to Hui. And this is Ciencias Sem Fronteras, who paid me the flight ticket to come to Brazil. So this is the reason that I can be here with you. And finally, I thank you for your attention, for coming uh, to this hall instead of going outside to the Brazilian Spring. But perhaps you might remember tonight my receipt of Caipirinha. Drink one and enjoy. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for the last talk. Very interesting. Uh, the iron tree compound that mm -hmm. you made uh, from ammonium chloride. Mm -hmm. If you use uh, earth, uh, alkaline metal uh, chloride, potassium or other, other alkaline metal chloride, you can obtain a similar structure. I think with potassium and also with thallium, you can obtain the same uh, structure. So we made it with, uh, one, with, with other positive metal ions. It works as well and re it remains ion three. This is the surprise. Can you, can you estimate how important are these uh, hydrogen bonds? And you have ammonia and you have uh, what, what means important, they simply, this is the basis for the coordination of ammonium in the center of this cavity, since there are no other interactions possible. And we have always problems with these compounds. You imagine from the crystal crystallographic point of view, we have huge blocks of complexes. And we always get some alert A's. There are some <laughs> there are voids without solvent. Yes. There are big voids without solvent, since we have these big balls and they have to arrange each other to, to a bigger unit to a crystal. And so it is preferable for the ammonium ion not to be somewhere between these big balls. It can be bonded inside the ball by good interactions. And ammonium fits perfectly. Uh, who is presently measuring um, nitrogen-15 NMR and deuterium NMR to this compound uh, with deuterated compounds, nonsense, deuterium NMR. This is smart. <laughs> uh, One question of the, hmm? uh, of the size of the ion, ammonium ion. That's why we can do with uh, potassium. Potassium, potassium makes weak interactions. I forgot also to mention at one place, we can make a size-dependent uh, metal exchange. Uh, this dry nuclear, uh, this dry nuclear complexes with three ligands accommodate alkaline metals. Uh, we can produce all compounds starting from potassium up to cesium. Most stable is cesium. So we, were, we did this work two years ago, accidentally with the Fukushima accident in Japan. And the main problem is how to capture, how to extract cesium out of the system. In principle, this works with these compounds. We can prepare the ammonium compound, and then we then add cesium ions. We did it with cesium-137 to get it quantified, the only nuclear experiment that we made. And what we saw, immediately the potassium is exchanged and the cesium goes in, and the cesium is tightly bonded. We can even exchange the cesium, since we can exchange the cesium by adding barium. When we then add barium ions to the system, the cesium is released. So this was the idea. This can be used to extract cesium, and we can uh, make it in a cycle we remove the cesium from the solution on a resin, for example. Then we take the resin for regeneration. We wash it with barium. And the idea is for then to remove barium. And this doesn't work. 
Uh, you, can, you, you can remove it, of course, with sulfuric acid, but then you destroy the ligand. We, we did not succeed to make the whole cycle. So it is a size dependence uh, coordination chemistry of the central ions, at least when you go to the alkaline and alkaline earth metals. Thank you for your nice talk, beautiful chemistry. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> How did you promote the synthesis when you use two or three metals? How you add the chemicals? As simple as you can imagine, all together. This is a kind of one pot synthesis. No, no, there, is no there is no order, and this is important. It must work without an order. And, okay. In some cases, I did not tell you the full truth. What I had on my slides here are the main products of the reactions. There are some reactions with these trinuclear compounds where you have a second group of compounds. We have also some triskelates as side products with some lanthanide reactions, uh, but these are minor products in a range of approximately 5%. The normal yield of these reactions of the products I have shown here are in the order of 80%. So the compounds I introduced here are simply formed when you dissolve the ligand, when you add the metals, and in some cases, I think in all, he added some uh, triethylamine as a supporting base. This is not required, but it accelerates the reaction. It goes faster, and the product is formed more quickly and in, more, in a better purity. But you can also simply let it stand for overnight, then also the reaction works, and the solid precipitates from the methanol solution. This is, and this is and this, this sol and this soluble in dichloromethane, for example. So this was a very nice chemistry for Jacob. He could, only in this way, he could produce, I think he has 50 or 60 structures in his PhD. Only in this way you can produce this big amount of structures. And he let some structures out due to some calculational problems. But the synthesis is simple, Not, nothing extra. First of all, congrats for your nice lecture. Thank you. Uh, you were talking about size. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's well known, calcium and platinum. They have almost the same size, and this is, uh, and they are used one of the other in the protein mm -hmm. crystallization. Did you try just for the same kind of compounds, changing just calcium and lanthanum in order to check? No. They, then you have the size mm -hmm. is the same, but the charge is different. No, we, we did not uh, play in this way since we did not leave the series in the exchange. Pro uh, experiment. So the calcium was in the series of the alkaline earth metals, but we can do this experiment easily. We have the compounds and this exchange reaction I mentioned also works with the isolated compound. And we have calcium 40. So it's always the question in how to evaluate in, in solution. And our exchange experiments we make in a simple way. We take the aqueous layer with a radioactive metal ion and the dichloromethane layer, then we shake, and then we see where is the radioactivity. And with cesium, we have a one-to-one -one reaction. It goes immediately to the organic phase. And we can even crystallize that. But you should not say that we crystallized a radioactive compound. Nobody here. Nobody here. Our radiation officer does. Thank you.